Hi, this is Adrian Molina and welcome to the Friends and Family YouTube channel. I'm so glad that you're here. At VU, we never want to go at it alone. We believe in passing on what we've learned and creating spaces for others to get resourced. You're about to watch a workshop from VUCon 2023. I hope it encourages you and equips you for whatever season you find yourself in. Enjoy. Uh, whenever you're going to talk about something, you want to make sure that we all agree on what we're talking about before we start to talk about it. When I use this word, this is what I mean by it. So when I talk about healing, one thing I'm talking about is, is this restoration of wholeness. Healing is a restoration of the wholeness that belongs to us intrinsically. This is how we should be. How many of you have ever been sick and you've been sick so long you forgot what it felt like to be well? And then the illness ended. And suddenly you felt well. And how many of you realize when you felt well, you suddenly felt like a million dollars? Like I can breathe. I can go outside. The air doesn't hurt, right? You know, like I feel well. And here's the thing. You already felt that before you got sick. But you forgot what it felt like to be healthy. And when that feeling comes back to you, you learn to appreciate the sense of wholeness. A lot of us look for healing because we know that we've missed something. But healing also is sometimes a restoration of something we've never had. Uh, for example, my, my wife and I are foster parents. And we recently got a call this week to, to take in a baby who recently born, mom, mom uh, is struggling, drug addict, but she took drugs through the pregnancy, a hard drugs. And so the baby was born with a drug addiction. So you have this newborn in a hospital who is already a drug addict. That newborn doesn't know what it's like to not be a drug addict. That newborn's body is craving something that isn't good for that newborn, and many of us sometimes, when it comes to healing, we are in a situation where we've always been unhealthy, and it seems normal to us. And sometimes what healing isn't just a restoration of something we lost, it's restoring something we didn't know we could have. And it's bringing us to the level that we didn't know was possible for us because of the family that I was raised in, because of the conditions I was born under, because of the culture that I'm in, I just thought this is the way things were. Sometimes the reason people don't understand what the church is offering is they're so unhealthy they don't see the problem to begin with. They don't see it as healing because they don't understand what wholeness looks like. So we want to talk about healing. Healing is a restoration of wholeness. When I talk about theology... One thing I mean by theology, I'm going to give you a couple definitions, but one thing I mean by theology is theology is simply our view of reality and our place within it. And I want to define it this way because I want to stress that every single person has a theology. Everybody has a view of reality. This is how they think the world is. This is what they think life is about. This is what they think people are. This is what they think they're supposed to do because of it. Everybody has a theology. The question is not, do you have a theology? The question is, is your theology a good one or is it a bad one? Is your theology good or is your theology bad? You're like, well, how do you determine whether a theology is good or bad? Two tests. Number one, how closely does it align with reality? Because reality is real whether you believe in it or not. You might go out into the street and decide, I don't believe that cars exist. That doesn't mean you're not going to get hit by one. And sometimes people have a theology that is so out of touch with reality, they weren't expecting the car when it hit them. They didn't understand this is what's real. This is what's going on. How closely does your theology align with reality? And secondly, how does your theology lead to healthiness? Because a good theology is one in which you are so closely aligned to reality it makes you healthy when you live with it. We're called to live with reality, not against reality. Theology is not about building an own, our own fantasy. Theology is about learning how to live in reality as God created it. 
Learning how to live the way the world actually is and to be healthy in light of what we can't change. So everyone has a theology. Is it a good one? Is it a bad one? Christian theology is a healthy theology. And I like to say it this way, Christian theology isn't just healthy because it aligns with reality, because it leads to healthiness, but Christian theology is all about healthiness. Why? Because Christian theology is about salvation, and salvation is healthiness. The word we actually use for salvation is actually the same word for healing. When you are being saved, how many know you're being restored? If healing is a restoration to wholeness, salvation is that. And when we talk about Christian theology, we're not just talking about a good view of reality, but we're talking about a view of reality that actually leads us to healing because it's all about healing. In fact, I like to define Christian theology this way. I like to call it the understanding, the explanation, and the application of the gospel. Theology is just the understanding, the explanation, and the application of the gospel. And, and sometimes when I'm teaching a class and I'm trying to explain theology, I like to do it like this. I'm not going to do it here because there's too many people here. We don't have time for that kind of dialogue. But I'm going to have you pretend I'm asking you this and you think of the answer in your head. I'll say to somebody, okay, if this is what theology is, it's, it's the understanding, the explanation, the application of the gospel. Somebody give me a definition of the gospel. And invariably, I'll have a student immediately raise their hand. And they'll go on for like three paragraphs. And I'm like, that is awesome. But it was too big. Give me a smaller definition. And then a student will raise their hand and they'll give me like maybe one paragraph. I'm like, again, that's great, but it's too big. Give me a smaller definition. And eventually, here's what I'll say to the entire class. I want you to give me a three-word sentence to describe the gospel. I want you to give me a subject. I want you to give me a verb. And I want you to give me a direct object. That's what I want. Now, right now, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask, what should the subject of theology be? Jesus or God? Okay. How many would agree that if theology is about anything, it should be about God? Okay. So we say God is the subject. What should the direct object be? No direct object. Yeah, so this becomes like, a, I didn't know it was a grammar test. Okay. So, so, so us, right? Like, like, like some form of us. Some people will holler out humanity. Some people will holler creation. All good. Some form of us. Now... What should the verb be? How many think saves? Typically, I'll get saves or loves or, or redeems or something like that. So I'll put it up here to my class and I'll say this. Okay, so here we have this definition of theology. God saves us. As soon as I say that to someone, they're going to ask me questions. What do you mean about God? Which God are you talking about? There's a lot of gods in the world. Tell me what you mean about God. Or saves. And I've done this analogy multiple times, but it's like you're walking down the street and I come out of nowhere and I tackle you to the ground. And you're looking up at me and my first words to you are, don't worry, I've saved you. And your question is, from what? Or us. So who's being saved? Who do we include in that? Just to unpack the gospel, we have to do theology. So theology has to answer these questions. When we talk about God, what do we mean by Father? What do we mean by Jesus? What do we mean by the Holy Spirit? When we talk about saves, what, 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 is, what is he saving us from? Here's sin. How is he saving us? What actually happened to lead to our salvation? And what is salvation for? What does it look like at the end? Give me a picture of God's ultimate view of wholeness. What about us? What about those of us who are human? Is that who's being saved? What about the people who are part of the church? What about that community? What about people who are outside the church? Do you realize that these are the traditional categories of theology? But these are also simply unpacking the gospel. And here's what, what I sometimes think we miss when it comes to theology, especially if we've only learned theology in a formal setting. 
we start thinking that theology is academic, and we don't realize that theology is organic. Theology is not academic. It's only academic because sometimes we've only learned it in a classroom setting. And in a classroom setting, what I have, like today, I have like one hour with the class, and I've got to get through something, and it's very formal, and it seems like, okay, here we're taking notes. What I'm doing when I'm teaching theology is I'm unpacking 2,000 years of pastoral wisdom of trying to explain the gospel. And that's all it is. One of the best lessons I ever had as a pastor teaching me this was I once had the chance to do a Bible study for a family in my church who said, Pastor, I want you to come to our house. They, 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 were, they were immigrants. They said, we have some family members who are from the old country who are coming. They're staying with us. We've never read the Bible before as a family. They're members of our family who have never read the Bible. Would you come and just do a Bible study for us? I said, sure. I show up to their house, and there are 30 people in a living room and kitchen. Cousins, aunts, uncles, all wanting to hear the Bible. So I go through one of the Gospels with them every single week. And what was so interesting to me, they're hearing it for the first time. Can you imagine talking to a community of people who've never actually heard the words before? And they started asking me questions about what this meant. And they started recreating some of the ancient heresies of the church. Because when you hear it for the first time, these are the organic questions you would have. These are the things you would actually wonder. This is how you would try to put it together. And I realized what theology is giving us and the way that pastors have learned how to explain the gospel in a healthy way so that it leads back to the gospel and not away from it. So theology is healthy to the extent that it's unpacking the gospel. And at the end of the day, what theology should really be about is it should be about the love of God as revealed in Jesus. In fact, uh, I, I love this verse here. It's, it's Luke, the, the lawyer comes to Jesus, says, what must I do you know, to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what does the law say? Here's what it is. Love the Lord your God with all your being. Love your neighbor as if they were you. And when it says, love the Lord your God with all your being, here's how they unpack it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. In one sense, all theology is, is it's learning to love God with all of your mind. I've said to sometimes some students, what is it that scares you about theology? And sometimes the answer they give me is this, I'm afraid if I study it too deeply, I'll find out it's not true. Like, I'm afraid to really dig into it. What if I find out it's not true? All I can say to them, here's what I promise you as someone who has studied it more years than you have. It's only going to make you love God more. It's only going to make you love God more. The study of theology is opening up our minds to love God with the full extent of our minds. No fear of questions that will come. God can handle our questions. In fact... I like to combine these verses to highlight this, and we're going to unpack this in a second, but I would say to you that theology is really about learning to love God and learning to love your neighbor, which is what? It's worship and it's ethics. Worship is learning to love God. Ethics is learning to love your neighbor, and it's theology that bridges the two. Because what theology does is theology promotes the love of God and it also promotes the love of everything that God loves. And when you start to learn who God is through theology and you start to learn what God has done through theology. In fact, let me give this to you as an illustration. Um, how many of you would love to receive a letter from the Apostle Paul? Just written to you. And Paul said to you, Julio, I write to you as an apostle of Jesus Christ, here you go. Well, some scholars think that we have something like that in the New Testament, and it's the letter to the Ephesians. And the reason they think that is the letter to the Ephesians is the only letter that Paul writes that doesn't have anything that's specific to a church within it, except for the word the Ephesians. And there's a belief along a lot of scholars that the letter to the Ephesians might be a circular letter which means that Paul wrote a standard letter that was meant to be passed on from church to church to church. Eventually, the church at Ephesus was the one that published it. But here's the point. If that's the case, 
And you said, what would Paul write to me in the 21st century as a Christian in a church he's never been to? And the answer would be, he would have handed you the letter to the Ephesians. The letter of the Ephesians, Paul, it's it's easy to divide. First three chapters is Paul's prayer for the church. Last three chapters is Paul's practical advice. In fact, he begins his prayer in chapter 1, and he says to the church, I've always prayed for you. And then he starts talking about Jesus and Paul being Paul. He goes off on a tangent. And by the time you get to chapter 3, he picks up the prayer again. So I want to show you the beginning and ending of the prayer to show you how these fit together. And here's what Paul says to the church. So here's Ephesians. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. Everyone say this to me, know him better. Paul says, I'm praying for you for what? That you would know him better. Secondly, Paul says, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order may you know the hope to which he has called you. Everyone say, know the hope to which he's called you. Okay, that was a long thing to say. But I want you to know him. I want you to know the hope. What is he talking about? He's talking about the gospel. I want you to know what he's called you to. And then when we get to chapter 3, he finishes this prayer. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you in the spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that being rooted and established in love, you may have power with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love. Say that with me, to know this love. To know this love that surpasses all knowledge. What is Paul's prayer for you? His prayer for you is this. He wants you to know God. He wants you to know the hope to which he's called you. And he wants you to know the love of God that surpasses all knowledge. That's the point of theology. That we learn to love God. And that by knowing God, we love God. And by loving God, we learn to love everything that God loves. So let's unpack this a little bit further. In theology, we want to learn how to love God. I've already given you this verse here that we love the Lord our God with all of our mind. There is no greater revelation of God than the one in Jesus, and there's no clearer picture of Jesus than that of the gospel. When you come to understand the gospel, you're getting the clearest picture of God you can ever get. How many of you ever looked through the pictures on your phone and realized sometimes you're not a good photographer? You know, sometimes I have pictures show up on my phone and they'll start going through like pictures of my family and then I'm always, I stop because I'm like, oh, there's my son when he was three. And sometimes I'm like, I've got to get a better phone. Look at how bad that picture is. Sometimes the picture's fuzzy. Sometimes it's, it's out of sync because sometimes I have an older phone. Sometimes it's so clear. And I think, well, man, that, that's beautiful. I want to enlarge that. When we come to the gospel, we have the clearest picture of God we could possibly have. This is what God is like. When you know the gospel, you come to know who God is. When you come to know God is, you come to love God. The knowledge of the gospel should bring us closer to God. And here's one way it leads to healthiness. The knowledge of the gospel leads us to worship. You know one thing that worship does for us that's healthy? It makes us quit worshiping ourselves. Learning to worship God takes the pressure off of us. Uh, I heard this quote from a famous Hollywood director. Some of you may have heard. Robert Eggers uh, has has done a lot of art house films. So if if you don't know who he is, it's because you only watch Marvel movies. Okay, but Robert Eggers, uh, a famous kind of art house director, uh, a couple years ago he was interviewed about his filmmaking. And here's what he said. He said, I wish I could be a medieval craftsman once again. I wish I could go back to that time. He said, I wish I could do art for the sake of God. Now, he's not a Christian. He's secular. His assumption, right, is that 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 has to belong to the Middle Ages. But here's what he says. I wish I could do art for the sake of God because right now I can only do the art for the sake of my own ego and I find it unbearable. Doing art for the sake of my ego feels unbearable. Unbearable. 
Here's the thing. When we learn to worship God, we also learn to start stop worshiping ourselves, and that makes us healthier. It takes the pressure off of us because it turns out the universe isn't about me. It turns out all the decisions I make aren't the most important things going on in the world. It turns out that what happens to me, I can learn to adjust because it's not the most important story I'm facing right now. Learning to worship God, learning to love God, takes the pressure off of me. When we learn to love God, we also learn to love the church. 1 John 3 tells us very clearly that if we love God, we're going to love the people of God. That it's impossible not to love the people of God if we love God. To know the gospel is to know God. To know God is to love God. To love God is to love each other. How many know that if you're dating someone who has a child and you want to get serious, you got to get serious about that child as well. Right? You can't date someone and not see the family. I can't say to my wife, hey, now that we're married, we never have to see your parents again. I mean, that's not the good start to a good marriage. If I love you, I'm going to have to learn to love the people that you love. If we love God, loving God teaches us how to love each other. And here's why that matters for health. When I learn to love one another, I actually learn how to be part of community. And how many know being a part of community is a lot healthier than not being a part of community? I learn to worship God and I take the pressure off myself as the object of worship. I learn to love other people in community, and now I have a community around me that I'm free to love, and they're free to love me. I think one of the biggest examples of what the church is supposed to be is a community that is not hard-hearted, but is open. I mean, we live in a world today that is really hard-hearted. We live in a world today that whether or not I want to be your friend depends on what bumper stickers you have on the back of your car and what signs you put up in your yard. We live in a hard-hearted culture. The church teaches us how to love, how to welcome, how to receive, how to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, and how to be with those who aren't yet brothers and sisters in Christ. But we see them the way that God does. We learn to love God, we learn to love each other, and we also learn to love the world. Now, I do want to highlight, because there are scriptures that warn us and say to us, don't, don't love the world. And what they're talking about is loving the world over God. But how many you know that God loves the world? For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. When we learn to love God, we can also learn to love the world that God created as if it's the gift of God. I can learn to love what God created as gifts. I can learn to receive people as if they could have been sent by God as a gift. My son, uh, a, few, a few years ago, what, what I did with my son for a while when, when he was growing up, and he's, I mean, he's still growing up, but I would read him the Bible every night, and then we would just go over Scripture together, uh, and it was always at his age level. But what I did was, this is going to sound like a huge nerd because I am, but I divided the entire Bible into 365 stories. And I tied each story to one day of the year, and it would ensure every year I would go through the Bible with my son. So come, it was always summer, winter solstice. Come summer solstice, we start in the Old Testament. Come winter solstice, we start in the New Testament. And we would just, so I'd start with creation. Summer's here, let's talk about creation. Winter's here, let's talk about the birth of Jesus. And, and we would go that way. My son, as a young child, would pick up on things that was so interesting to me because, again, he's hearing some of these stories for the first time. He's asking these questions, and I don't want to do like the parent, like, my son's a genius. My son's not a genius. But every child will sometimes say the most interesting things. How I many you know that? So once we were giving him the story of Abraham entertaining God and the two angels who came to Abraham's tent, and my son was struck by this, and he's like, well, how did they not know that, how did Abraham not know they were angels? I said, well, son, they don't look like angels like you've seen pictures of. They, they don't have wings, and, and I also stress this, they weren't white. They don't look like what you think they look like, all these pictures of angels. He's like, you mean an angel could look like anybody? 
I said, yeah, an angel could look like anybody. Many times in scripture, they look like anybody. And he says to me, well, if that's true, how, how come we don't treat every stranger if they could have been sent by God? And, and my wife was like, okay, bedtime. That was it. That's the lesson right there. That's the lesson. When you learn to love God, you learn to love the world and you learn to receive the world as a gift. And you learn to see other people as if they could be a gift from God. In fact, some psychologists have argued that one of the things that's killing our culture is the pursuit of happiness. And the reason it's killing our culture is that happiness is always a byproduct of other things. It's never something you achieve if you're pursuing happiness for itself. Happiness comes because you're pursuing something else that made you happy. Not because happiness was the thing you were pursuing. And what some have argued is what we should be teaching people, and, and this is coming from a secular side, so, but I just want to highlight this. What we should be teaching people is not how to seek happiness. What you should be teaching people is how to seek wonder. Learning how to have wonder in the world that we live in and letting happiness be a byproduct of that. And I hear that and I think, well, that's just learning to love the world. It's learning to appreciate the world as God's gift and to appreciate other people as a gift of God. We learn to love God and it takes the pressure off of us. We learn to love the church and we have a community. We learn to love the world and we have wonder. And finally, what theology should promote is we learn to love ourselves. Let me go here. Okay, yeah, we learn to love ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from church history comes from Bernard of Clairvaux. Everyone say Bernard of Clairvaux. I now award you your degree. So Bernard of Clairvaux uh, was uh, a 12th century monk, uh, one of the most outstanding churchmen of his day. But in fact, how powerful was he? Uh, two of the people he mentored became pope. You know, you know you're cool when, when your disciple was pope, right? You know, that's Bernard de Clairvaux. Bernard de Clairvaux argued this, and I'm going to give you the argument in just a second. But here's what he said I think is so powerful. He said that there's, there's four degrees of love towards maturity. There's four degrees of love that we have to work through. He said, first off, we have to learn how to love, or he said, first off, we love ourselves for the sake of ourselves. He said, everyone's born with that love. How many would say that I was born with wanting to take care of myself? I was born with wanting to please myself. Right? That's self-love. He said, and a lot of people, when they come to God, they love God for the sake of themselves as well. I start off by loving myself for the sake of myself, then I come to love God for the sake of myself. So now, why, why do I love God? Well, I might love God because I don't want to go to hell. I might love God because I have need. I'm turning to God, but I'm turning to God because of what I want, right? I, I once, uh, the, in my church in California, I was pastor for many years in L.A. Our church was right across the street from a police station. Uh, and one day, on a Sunday morning, there was a guy who was pulled off for a traffic stop right by the police station who turned out to have warrants out for his arrest. The police officer pulls him over. He knows they're going to find out he has warrants. He freaks out, and he runs out of his car, just starts taking off running. The police call in for help. They're right at the police station. So all of these officers empty out of the police station in pursuit. What's across the street from the police station? Our church. It's Sunday morning. We're in the middle of service. He runs into church with the entire police department running behind him. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't interrupt the service. What they do is they simply cover every exit. He runs in, in the middle of worship. He runs down to the altar. One of our pastors walks down to meet him, and this guy says out loud so everyone can hear him, I need God, and I need God right now. I mean, no, he had a need for God, right? Sometimes we turn to God out of love of self. And Bernard said, but then we move into another stage. And that stage is we learn to love God for the sake of God. So I love me for the sake of me. Then I love God for the sake of me. Then I learn to love God for the sake of God. I actually get pleasure out of God without worrying about myself. I learn to love God unselfishly. You know, it's like a parent, you love your children unselfishly because many times your children just make your life harder and you still do things because you want them to be happy. 
You're learning, you learn to love God unselfishly. And I mean, you'd say, that, that's it, that's, that's the maturity. No, no, there's one more. And here's what Bernard says. We learn to love ourselves for the sake of ourselves. Then we love God for the sake of ourselves. Then we love God for the sake of God. But here's the last stage of maturity. We learn to love ourselves for the sake of God. I'm not fully mature until I can see myself the way that God sees me. I'm no longer loving myself for the sake of myself. I'm learning to love myself for the sake of God. I appreciate me for what God did for me, for how God sees me, for how God loves me. That's acceptance. It doesn't mean I justify myself. It doesn't mean I live for my desires. It means I see myself through the eyes of God. And I appreciate myself the way I should be appreciated. So let me say to you, if we learn to love God and worship and we take the pressure off of ourselves, if we learn to love others as God loves them and we find ourselves in community, if we learn to love the world as the gift of God and we fill ourselves with wonder, if we learn to love ourselves the way that God loves us and we find acceptance, how many of you would say, I think we're becoming healthy? Those are steps to healthiness. But there's also theology, because we all have a theology that isn't. And here's the way I want to define those. You go back to this. If we take any one of these loves, love of the church, love of the world, love of ourself, and we put them over the love of God, we start building an unhealthy theology. For example, there is such a thing as a cultural theology, which is simply learning to love the world over loving God. If we only use theology to accommodate culture, how many know that many times there are people who, if you ask them what they believe, they're telling you whatever the culture believes that they live in. They simply borrow the script from their culture. That's their theology. They're learning to love the world, but they love the world over God. The world is the one that's driving them, and the problem with that is, one, culture is always changing, so that means your theology is always changing. But two, whatever is unhealthy in culture is now going to be unhealthy in your theology. A cultural theology is no less healthy than a culture without theology. Because it just reflects what everyone else says. It's love of world over love of God. Then we have a cultic theology. A cultic theology is when we love the church over love of God. How many know there's a lot of Christians out there who have what I like to call an us versus them mentality? That there's us who are in the church and there's everybody else. And they don't see that the church exists for the sake of the world. They think the church only exists for the sake of the church. And if you're part, we love you. If you're not a part, well, we don't want to have anything to do with you. They see those outside the church as an enemy. That is a cultic theology And if that gets pushed to its limits, eventually that church could itself turn into a cult. Because we develop such a siege mentality of us versus them that we become more and more isolated from everybody else. In fact, here's my way, uh, kind of quick and easy, of defining the difference between a church and a cult. A church is designed to make you more spiritually mature so that you can lead in the community. A cult is designed to make you more and more dependent so that you can't make decisions for yourself. The goal of a a church is increasing spiritual maturity. The goal of a cult is that you become increasingly dependent and unable to think for yourself so they don't have to worry about you. A cultic theology is an us versus them mentality. And here's what's wrong with it. What you end up doing is you love the church more than you love God. You love your community more than you love God. And because of that, you don't love people who are outside that community. Does that make sense? You can have a cultural theology, that's unhealthy. You can have a cultic theology, that's unhealthy. Or you can have, and just for lack of a better term, I call it a narcissistic theology, which is where you learn to love yourself over loving God. 
There's so many people out there who, if you ask them about their theology, they're going to give you simply a theology they're building for themselves based on whatever they want today. I'm the center of my own theology. Sometimes it's that I'm spiritual, not religious line, where what people really mean is I just have a buffet and I pick and choose what I want at the time. But here's the problem. Narcissistic theologies are always built around what I can do for myself. They're not built around what I need God to do for me. Because what I need God to do for me requires me to get on my knees before God. A narcissistic theology, it's about what I can do for myself. It's this new practice I learned. It's this new idea I have. It's this new self-help book I have. I'm learning to build myself, but I'm not learning to depend on God. It's a love of self over a love of God. And we find these, true theology, healthy theology, love of God, love of church, love of world, love of self. Narcissistic, cultural, cultic theologies, love of God is no longer in first place. That helps determine the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy theology. So my question is this, what do we need to do to make sure our theology stays healthy? What do we need to do to make sure our theology stays healthy? And I'm going to give you three, three quick guides real quick. The first is simply this. I want to make sure that you have a good method for your theology. What I mean is, as you're developing your understanding of God, your knowledge of God, your knowledge of God's Word, I want you to keep everything in check. And I'm about to give you the most difficult slide in this entire presentation. But I'm going to show you a picture to kind of illustrate it. But here's what it is. You always begin with Scripture, because Scripture is the primary source and foundation of your theology. Whatever we say, we begin with, what does the Bible say? The Bible is proven. The Bible is trusted. The Bible is shared by every Christian. The Bible is the thing that we depend on. It is our primary source. After that, we can turn to tradition. Tradition is how the church has applied the Bible over years, and while the Bible is primary, tradition is also proven. Why? Because it's been working for hundreds of years. Understand, you can ask the question, how has the church read this? How has the church done this? How has the church applied this? Because if it's worked, they would have passed it on to the next generation. If it didn't work, they wouldn't have. If this keeps getting passed on from parent to child and parent to child, there's something about it that works and is healthy. What does our tradition say? doesn't mean it's infallible. Christians can be wrong. How many you know that? But if you have Christians who've been saying the same thing for 2,000 years, there's something you can trust about that. Then we turn to culture. Culture is our forming source. And what I mean by that is this. We cannot escape our culture. We can't ignore our culture. We just have to make sure that culture maintains the right place in our theology. Scripture first, then tradition, then culture. That includes our knowledge base. What do we think that we know now? I mean, you know, there's things we're discovering the Bible never talks about, right? The Bible never tells us how to do open heart surgery. There's things that we need to know in our culture that's not going to be found in Scripture. Scripture, culture also gives us art. And art teaches us things about our values and our perspective that can also help us in our theology as long as it stays in its place. It doesn't have authority over the Word of God. Scripture, tradition, culture, and then we come to experience, which is a confirming source. John Wesley was a great theologian of experience, and he basically argued this, if it's true, it's something that Christians should be able to experience to be experienced morally, to be experienced prayerfully. In fact, there's a great line from the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is, if it cannot be prayed, it should not be taught. Whatever we believe has to fit within our life of worship. Whatever we live has to be something we can experience, that we can know. If I preach divine healing, guess what I should see at some point? I should see people healed, right? I mean, that experience confirms that I'm interpreting this correctly. I'll give you another example for John Wesley. John Wesley grew up in a tradition that did not allow women to be preachers. And yet John Wesley, over the course of his life, started to believe that God had called women to preach. How did he change that theology? Because he heard women preaching. 
And he recognized the Holy Spirit was at work, and it caused him to go back and say, have I read the Scripture correctly? It's not tradition over Scripture. It's not culture over Scripture. It's not experience over Scripture. It's experience saying, maybe I need to go back and reread something. Because I see the Holy Spirit at work. And then finally, we have reason, which is simply the tool for understanding, are we doing everything reasonably? Am I reading the Bible reasonably? Am I reading tradition reasonably? Am I interpreting culture reasonably? Am I interpreting my experience reasonably? Now, how many of you, you might have heard this, have heard of the Wesleyan quadrilateral? Okay, no one, if you, some of you have. Uh, it's a real famous in theology because it was John Wesley's way of doing theology that, that has, has been called the quadrilateral in the 20th century. It's tradition, scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. I added culture because I'm concerned that we need to have a place for culture because culture's there anyway. We need to be able to recognize it. So I don't have a quadrilateral. I have a pentagram or a pentagon. But the pentagon is irregular because scripture's at top. So here's my irregular pen. Oh, you know what? It didn't show up on the slide. Okay. Well, anyway, it would be really cool if I showed it to you. Scripture, tradition, culture, experience with reason connecting. Have a good method. Make sure scripture stays up front. Secondly, for your theology, have a good devotional life. Have a good devotional life. When we do theology, we always do it in an attitude of prayer. We always do theology in an attitude of prayer. Devotions because we submit to God every day. How many know that whenever you are in prayer, whenever you are submitting to God, in a sense, you're forcing your heart to stay open to God for today? Have you ever gone a few days, you don't have to raise your hand to this, and not prayed or read your Bible? And the longer you go, the easier it is to forget to do that. Because I start making decisions on my own, I start forgetting about God. But every day when I stop because one thing about a devotional life is it causes us to stop. When I stop, when I pray, it's like I've taken a wedge and I've put that wedge in the door of my heart to make sure it doesn't lock against God. That I'm here for God. I want to receive from God. I want to hear from God. I've known too many people doing theology who still have a closed heart to God. Devotions helps us maintain that open heart, that open relationship. And again, it's kind of like a marriage. You realize that my wife expects me to have a conversation with her every single day? There are some days when I'm busy. There are some days when I'm tired. There are some days where I'd really like to just not do anything, and yet my wife will say, we haven't talked today. I mean, you've ever heard that. You know what? I got to keep an open heart and I do that in relationship. When you have devotions, you're having a relationship with God that keeps an open heart because what makes a theology healthy versus unhealthy is where the love of God is in that theology. Is it at the top or is it second or is it third? You want to maintain a healthy theology? You want to maintain a theology that leads to health? You make sure love of God is first. And then finally, we want to make sure that we submit to God in everything, and that we do theology in community. We've got to do theology in community. We have to do it together. As Christians, we depend on each other. How many know your experiences in life aren't everyone else's experience? How many of the people who've experienced things you don't understand? There's things God's dealing with people that you haven't felt. When we do theology together, we hear their experiences. We see what God is doing with them. Theology always by myself is always going to be limited by my own life. But theology with others will now expand to the community I'm a part of. We want to do theology in community because that community will also keep us directed back to God. I'll say this. Have you ever had a life where you have at times felt like you were weak on Jesus? Sometimes I'm, I'm like a gas tank. Today I just feel like I'm low on Jesus. Have you ever had that experience? And then you'll hang out with a brother and sister in Christ, and sometimes it's like filling your tank back up. Like I was with this person, and, and I went to bed, or the next morning I woke up, and now I feel like I'm full on Jesus. Because the community filled me back up. The community reoriented me. The community focused me in the right direction. I want to know 
God. And the way to know Him is to know the Gospel. But to know Him is to love Him. To love Him is to love His people. To love Him and His people includes loving the world He created. And when it's through, I finally learn to love myself. And when this happens, I have become a healthy person. Thanks for watching. I hope that this workshop encouraged you. If you want to get more content like this, check out the VU Friends and Family Network, which is created to equip you with free resources and real relationships. And hey, don't miss out the opportunity to be in the room next year for VUCon 2024. It's a gathering of global leaders designed to strengthen your faith and connect you to community.